Hi, great to be here. I'm Marcus Jones. I'm working at BigchainDB, who is implementing the Ocean Protocol project. So I've been at uh, BigChain and working on Ocean directly for, I guess, a year and a half now. Um, and I'm a data scientist, and that's why I was brought into Ocean, to help flesh out the concept for data science and what does that mean for Ocean Protocol. Um, just a quick survey, who has heard of Ocean Protocol in the audience? Okay, quite a few people, awesome. Um, I also have a question that I usually... So actually, I, I give a lot of talks at data science to data science audiences or crypto audiences, um, so it's really fun to have a different type of audience, let's say some people coming from scientific publishing, for example. Um, I always start with a question, who here has used a DAP in the last week? And was that DAP your own DAP or a different? Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. That's really interesting. Why, you know, we've had, for example, the Ethereum network has been around for so long and people have promised huge adoption and it's going to change everything, but actually there's not a huge amount of, of actual usage. And we can come back to that in a bit. Um, yeah, so why is it interesting for me, especially here at Blockchain for Science? Well, I've had some interaction with, with scientific publishing, for example, and I was quite fortunate at university. My mother was in the library department, and after I graduated, she still gave me her access. So I went to, after graduation, I was uh, working in a research agency, and it's the National Re Research Agency in Austria. And funnily enough, they, didn't they could not afford to have access to a proper, uh, I guess, like when I was at school, it was called Compendex, for example, or yeah, you all know what I mean, like these big uh, compilations of papers. And actually my research agency, the National Research Agency of Austria, it simply could not afford the subscription fee to have access to scientific papers. And a lot of people would come up to me and I would give them my, my mother's password for this account. And it was um, not quite above board, but uh, it seemed to work at the time until she then retired and then I lost access. And this was a really dark period for me. So it's when it really hit me like, okay, most, this, is, this should be basic, a basic human right, like getting access to scientific knowledge. And so I'm, I'm yeah, I, I, I was quite interested to prepare something for this talk. And um, just yesterday, I hacked something quickly together. So it's gonna be a bit of a demo at the end too. Okay, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about the, um, some motivation, why does Ocean Protocol exist? And then we'll go over what is Ocean Protocol and talk about what does it mean to be an asset in Ocean Protocol, um, talk about some research topics and then this sort of demo thing at the end. So we know that data is valuable um, and there have been a few studies but we don't really know what this data economy is. You know, what is it really, uh, like where do you draw the boundaries so there's companies like Google that are fully data-driven, let's say they're AI first even. So that's another term that's, that's become, so first you, let's say, maybe you digitalize um, and eventually maybe your company becomes AI first. What does that mean? That means all of your business processes have to be in support of, of artificial intelligence. So some numbers, so let's say many trillion euros globally. I don't really know. And of course it's a very, you know, one of the reasons it's hard to define is all of these steps, like from, from generation, processing, exploitation, how do you exploit the data, how do you generate value from it. Why? Well, one huge driver is, is artificial intelligence. Um, so we have this, this result, um, yeah, almost 20 years ago now, but this result showed that, uh, indeed, when you put more data into a model, the model improves which at the time was, was quite surprising, especially the people that were researching these algorithms because they were paid there to increase the performance by a few percentage points by spending a year researching how to squeeze out that last bit of performance when actually you could have just collected more data and, and used that salary that you're paying that person, you just add more data. This is especially true for deep learning. Uh, this is a study um, at, they went to a, a NIPS conference, and they were asking all of the researchers there, there was about 300 people in the study, um, when do you think deep learning, or let's say AI in general, will replace some of these tasks? 
So we've seen already image recognition, we can exceed human performance already. And then of course these amazing results from the game of Go, where we're also exceeding human performance, we're beating grandmasters. And part of that is due to this huge amount of data that we're putting into these systems. So data is valuable. Another challenge is this concept of orchestrating all this data. So we're producing just by existing data with our smartphones, um, smart devices, IoT devices, and then of course in the corporations and enterprises and just everywhere. There's exponential growth of data, but you also need to organize and orchestrate it. So orchestration really means automating this flow from, from raw data to getting value out of that. And there's a lot of issues, for example, provenance. How do you track the, how this data set is transformed through your business? And who do you blame if it goes wrong, for example? And this all leads to a loss of potential value. And then, of course, we get into the next level, which is AI orchestration. So now throw into this original data orchestration issue, so not just data, now try to track the models. So now, you know, when, uh, let's say, when the model goes wrong, how do you, how do you fix it and why, why does it break? Um, just, just the versioning of models, um, the versioning of the data that's used to train the models, the new incoming data, it's just very, um, yeah, very complex system. So that's part of the motivation for us so the AI orchestration or the data economy, I like to use this term AI ecosystem. It's, we don't really know what it looks like actually, but this is one of the key motivators for why Ocean Protocol as a project was started. Um, so yeah, before I go on, like the, just in a nutshell, Ocean Protocol is a, is a decentralized protocol. So it's, it's not a, it's not an application, it's literally a protocol at the core level. And that protocol enables you to accomplish some of these goals of orchestration for the, the AI ecosystem. One key aspect of that is this concept of a static asset. So we're gonna start there. So as a data scientist, this is a simplified view of basically your entire life as a data scientist. So you start with data, you create some model pipeline. This, let's say it's a Jupyter notebook and you have a bunch of scripts that are gonna be coming in and they're going to take the raw data. They're gonna transform it and then they're gonna train a model. That's happening on some execution server, so compute. It's then going to produce the trained weights or it's gonna produce the actual model. Then you take that model into production and you generate some value. That's the whole purpose of existing as a data scientist. You wanna eventually get some value out of, out of the result. And of course, this is very simplified because you do this in a very iterative way and you go back and you evaluate the metrics and you say, oh, this didn't work. Let's do it all over again with a different transformer on the data or a different model. Okay, so the first thing that you're probably aware of also if you've heard of Ocean Protocol is that we can register data on, the, on Ocean Protocol. And that's indeed what the current status is. You can register definitely data onto Ocean and so when I look at it as a data scientist, I see more, I see actually you can register any type of static asset. And that's, that's simply a thing that um, is not dynamic, let's say, it's, it's static. That means you access that thing once and you get it and, and that's basically the end of the story. Um, so that's, that's sort of a static asset, but there's, the reason why I'm using that word static asset because I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to contrast it with a dynamic asset or a, the generalized asset. Another interesting thing is that this whole workflow could also be a static asset. It's just a composition of several of these uh, DIDs. So that's a core concept in Ocean Protocol. It's a decentralized identifier, which is a Web3 standard. I think it's still in alpha. But we use this extensively. So it's basically, basically just the URL for um, an entity in, in the network, in the blockchain network. It's uh, the identifier. And that DID resolves to something called a DDO, which is a DID document which describes that, that asset. So, um, yeah, by the way, this is, this is what more, a more realistic workflow looks like. So many, 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 many steps, like little transformations, and then getting the model, and then at the end we do a bunch of training and cross-validation, and then 
Actually, we do that all like 10 times after another. Okay, so again, like a, a static asset has a, a DID. So that DID is what's registered on chain. That's the pointer to the asset. Interestingly, for Ocean Protocol, we also assign an owner. So that's a public address. So that means you, and ownership, of course, is another important concept in, in decentralized tech is how do you manage the rights that you have to that um, as, as the owner of that. So in, in a sense, it's, it's representing the control. And with your private key, that gives you the rights to do certain things, your cryptographically um, guaranteed rights. Um, of course, we also want to store, for example, the checksum uh, on chain. So that means that this data asset is now, it's, um, let's say you could change the underlying, the underlying data, but if you do, then someone's going to know because they'll just calculate the checksum and say, hey, you changed that. The DDO is the next thing, so that's the description of the, of the asset, so that's the metadata, and that's just a JSON document that we, that we store all the metadata for. And then the actual asset itself can be stored in, basically we're quite agnostic to that, so we have drivers for IPFS, we have Azure, we have S3 on-premise, and the whole process of accessing this data then comes down to taking the DID, the one that you want, so you could search through the metadata and you, you like this one, and then you request access to the underlying asset, and then the server will send it to you. That's, that's how static assets work right now. And these are the main components at a very, very high level. So we have the user interacting with some library, and that could be the Python library. We have a very detailed Python library and a JavaScript library for the front end. And they're both um, in line with each other, so the basic, basic terminology is the same. And the, this is our metadata storage, and then this is acting as basically a proxy. So it's going to hide the data, and it's going to control access after you, after you purchase or fulfill the condi conditions to access that, um, that underlying. So um, yeah, a bunch of examples I'm going to, let's see, switch over really quick, if I can. I might need some help with the Mac. Or maybe just click this first and then maybe just be on standby. <laughs> on standby, just in case. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is our actual live, one of our live production networks. So it's actually one of our test nets. So um, I guess I should even take a step back further and say Ocean Protocol is a nonprofit foundation. All of the work that we do is open source for Ocean Protocol. It's all on GitHub. And this is a, what we call the Commons Marketplace. The Commons Marketplace is a way to register these types of, of assets that have a price of zero. So they're commons, yeah? they're just free data sets. Why do we do that? Well, you can go to our GitHub page, you can take this exact website, all the JavaScript, you can, you can fork it, and build your own marketplace, change the, change the logo, and you've got your own marketplace, change it to, instead of having a price of zero, you change it to a price of whatever you would like, and you've just got a marketplace running on Ocean. So we have, in this marketplace, I just added some, a bunch of sample assets for different, so different data sets, and we can just look at quickly how the publish flow works. So let's just, um, yeah, test asset. And then here's one thing that was just released in September, which is really amazing, which is we now support IPFS fully. So you take your data set, let's say it's a zip bunch of CSV files, you drag them on here, and, and then they're uploaded to IPFS in the background. So you don't need to be responsible now for making that endpoint, that underlying asset, you don't have to put that in S3 yourself, for example. That, that was one, one place where we saw a huge amount of friction from users. And the other, the other source of friction that we saw from users, so again, like when I go to a data science conference, I ask, yeah, how many dApps have you used? And then the other question I have is, um, do, you, do you have MetaMask? And people are like, what, what's MetaMask? I've never heard of that. And so this is another key thing that we identified in, in onboarding new people is, um, avoid MetaMask as, as a first, uh, you know, in the first instance, in the, at the first point of contact, 
So we actually, on every login, we, we give you a burner wallet, and then that's acting as your proxy. And of course, it's not, um, you know, you shouldn't use that forever, but it's for a commons marketplace, totally fine. And yeah, then if I had a data set, I would drop it in there, and then it would add the metadata um, just as text, and then it would be registered and show up as, let's just take this first one here. So it has a category, date, and author, and then this is again this DID, which is the unique identifier for this asset. So the idea would be you, you search for something. Let's try genetics. I think there's something there. You'd search for something, and then you would get file, and then it would start um, interacting with the blockchain and checking. It's going to check certain things like, yeah, do you have enough money? Secondly, um, can, we, can we lock that into escrow for you? So that's another key aspect. And then finally, it will start streaming that once everything is confirmed. And that's a very, that's a very simple example of what we call a service execution agreement, which can be um, a very complicated composite of, of conditions that we fulfill, including things like, let's check to make sure that this data set has been verified by three nodes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that, that, that type of functionality is, is not in this commons marketplace. So to continue, so again, some key concepts at Ocean. It's all about unlocking data. How do we get there? There's a lot of, a lot of stuff um, that we can go into detail on, but some key concepts for, for us. So we want to be open source, decentralized, permissionless, be governed by the community, and we want to support all these types of different incentivization mechanisms and different ways of yeah, we don't, again, like coming back to this AI ecosystem, we don't really know what it will be. Um, so we want to provide some underlying technology which enables the community to decide how to, how to build on Ocean. So this, this community governance is, is also very important. Like right now we're a nonprofit registered in Singapore with a board. The idea and the dream is to completely make that board obsolete and give that over to the community and that would be, let's say, governed by DAO. That's the, that's the target. Okay, so lots of developer resources, so at oceanprotocol.com. Um, you can also contribute to things like, yeah, what do you want to see next? And you can make, uh, propose a spec for some cool feature. We have a lot of test networks and public networks as well, um, including the Commons, the Commons Marketplace, which I displayed. We also have a version of that, which, you're, which you are actually able to, today, change the price from zero to whatever you want, use your blockchain identity, and then you can sit back and people will pay you if, if they like it. Yeah, so the next thing is, actually, we've talked about, we've talked about the static assets, but in a sense, getting a static asset is a service, right? You're, you're calling a service, and this service is streaming you a file. So that's the more general way to look at it, is that you get access to an endpoint. And that could be, for example, some you know, a REST API, with you buy a token to that. And okay, now that it's a REST API, you, you basically unlocked all of Web 2.0 with that. So now we have all of Web 2.0 um, potentially at our fingertips. So one of the first targets we have is compute. So, yeah, so for example, some examples, um, you could say, yeah, I will give you SSH access to my GPU instance for some price per hour. Or um, I, have an, I have a model, you send me an image, I'll give you back the classification of that image. So uh, let's, let's say there's uh, satellite images of uh, the Amazon rainforest, and you want to know if that, that area has been deforested or not. Well, that could also be an endpoint on Ocean. You could say per image, some amount of Ocean token. So streaming IoT data or training on, um, training on data. And now that, that's even more interesting. So now if I train a model and I'm doing it on your server and the result I get back is the model, then I've actually never ever seen your data. That's extremely interesting. So that's actually for us one of the killer apps of Ocean Protocol. So that means you can train on data that you never see. Okay, that's, for example, um, 
data in an enterprise that's segregated over the globe. They have operations in China and the US. The Chinese data science department wants to gain insight about training their, their business process. Let's say they're a mobility company. They want to learn how urban mobility works in general. They have no data. They want to look at the US data. Then the lawyers get involved. Then you've got a huge compliance issue. What if the Chinese, um, the Chinese team is able to send their pipeline, their Jupyter script, to the entity in the US, train it there, and then receive the model back? So very, very interesting um, operation mode. And what about genetics data, for example? So that's even potentially more interesting and more impactful. And there's, so this is all a very interesting stuff which we're currently researching. So we have a client project for this exact topic and we have a lot of other um, backend support for this. And that's our next version, so stay tuned. So some different modes, there's a lot of different things we can do. So for example, just, so for example, you could also say, but if I send you my training script, then you have my training scripts. Okay, then maybe you trust a third party. So then you have a third party as a double blind. Or federated learning. We can enable federated learning using this. Uh, maybe you want to enhance that with homomorphic encryption. Or again, like this other, this first case actually demonstrates this where the, you're, I'm, a, I'm not even receiving the model back. All I'm getting back is access to an endpoint, which is the predictions of that model. So I don't even get the model back. So there's no model escape either. And yeah, there's a lot of research on, on this stuff. So I want to get to, to, just to wrap up some, so again, like yesterday I was just thinking about, okay, what can I, what can I talk about? And I'm really interested in this topic of, of science and uh, science publishing. And right now what we have is uh, PDFs, let's say. And that's, that's amazing, quite frankly. Um, this is a lifesaver for me. So I use this all the time. I use archive or archive all the time. And I thought, okay, well, actually this could be, this could be really interesting to build something like this. What if, we, what if we have ocean as well in the mix? And then I was thinking, what about something like this? So we have this paper, Deep Image Retrieval. It's a data science paper. There's four authors. Um, what if I was able to click on it and I got the source data? What if I was able to click somewhere else and I got the model that they used to train, um, so their actual model? How cool would that be as a reviewer to click on something and I actually get the, not only the source data, the model, and even the pipeline in the notebook, but I actually get the compute server. So that's, I click that and it maybe looks like this. So I click, and then I'm, let's say I go through some purchase process or some access control process. I start up an instance in the cloud with Jupyter Notebook running. So this is Jupyter Lab. We're, so at Ocean, we also have another front end. I can't really demo it right now, but it's, because you need to log in, but it's uh, running Jupyter Hub, which is your own instance of Jupyter Lab running in the cloud. And it's already preloaded with all of the author's libraries. Um, it has the data, it has the pre-trained model. And that's all enabled right at your fingertips. So that would be very cool. Um, how would that work in the back end? So for example, in Ocean Protocol, we would have one asset, which would be, let's say, yeah, just it's like a web. Right, like there's all these things that connect to each other, so attribution network, right? So from Zarkham earlier. Um, so these are the authors, so they would have on the edge, they would have the tag author, clearly. Um, everything in Ocean is a DID and a DDO. That's how we conceive of it, and that's what enables, so it's a really basic primitive that we're building on, and this enables uh, all of this. So then you would have the core research, and this would be linked to the pre-trained model, so some type of composite asset. The actual implementation would be a Jupyter notebook, and that, that would be, so actually I, I went online and I searched and I found somebody that actually took this paper and implemented it for his PhD. And he has a, a Jupyter notebook, 
So yeah, that could this this PhD student could link directly to this research. What if somebody went ahead and said, actually, this is very cool. We'd like to offer this type of compute server. And this compute server is what I just showed you. It's, it, has, it has the data, the notebook, the pre-trained model, and the PDF research, and the whole body of knowledge. And it's organized, let's say it's owned by a person. It could also be a DAO. It could be Blockchain for Science DAO, let's say, that these, we all get together and we say, we want to support this. We donate to this, or maybe we do it at cost. We pay for the Amazon cost ourselves. It's governed by DAO. That'd be pretty cool. And of course, you know, we can go on and on. Like, so provenance, this is version two. Let's store every previous version on there. Let's link them together. Let's have, okay, so this model is, is VGD16, which is the visual geometry group in Oxford. They train this model. Um, but there might be models out there that that aren't open source, that maybe we'd like to purchase, and maybe it's trained by a group and we want to delegate payments to everybody that helped to train that model. So we, we have maybe, maybe many, many owners that are receiving partial payments. We could also, with this notebook, this notebook could be living on the same instance as the data itself. So you don't need to transfer the data. So there's one aspect, which is just the inertia of the data. So it's moving and it's, you know, maybe it takes you two hours to download, or you can't download it at all. Maybe it's sitting on premise, so now it's, let's have compute the data. This notebook, maybe it's not free, you can charge per hour. Um, this, uh, this, this implementation is curated. This, this author has upvotes, so maybe you're more inclined to, to go and use this author's notebooks. Um, yeah, and so these assets I published just yesterday, and they're now in the Commons network. And of course, with decentralization, this could be anybody in the world that has access to the internet, and there's no censorship, et cetera. You guys all know that. So it's very cool stuff. So road ahead. So again, the core mission is to unlock data. So we want to allow and incentivize this, this discovery and access to data, which is, let's say, our current status. Um, right now, these composite assets are supported in principle, but there's, it's just a matter of changing the structure of the DDO to then... So our, our structure of this DDO, which is, the, again, the description of the DID, uh, or the metadata, if you call it, is completely flexible. It's a JSON, and you could add an attribute say, saying, um, yeah, version, like previous version, and then you could link that. So it's, again, it's an attribution network, completely flexible. Um, and the current focus of the core dev team is this compute to data, which is, again, very, very exciting. And then in the longer term, permissionless ecosystem. So incentivization. So a lot of the research topics that, that have been presented by, by Paul and, and Zarkham and others, um, yeah, you should join in the, the conversation in our office. It's, it gets pretty interesting at times to talk about, yeah, NFTs and DAOs and bonding curves, and it's awesome. Um, so then, yeah, bigger goal, fully permissionless and ownerless. So what does that mean? That means ocean as a, a substrate or a public utility for, for data. So that means anybody has the right to access it and to use it as they wish. And yeah, on the, on the, on the right-hand side, again, just some, you know, there's so much, you know, that's, each of these topics, take one of these and then apply it to Ocean Protocol, and you'll get another 30-minute talk um, out of us. And there's a lot of a lot of blog posts on a lot of these topics as well. So we've had uh, full-time researchers for a year, uh, one at least on on just curation and provenance, a bunch of blog posts on bonding curves. I'm currently really invested in this federated learning aspect, so I'm now training. Um, yeah, models on data that I don't have access to for a client. And yeah, again, that's, that's, that's Ocean Protocol. And then at BigchainDB, where my contract is, that's um, for us maybe a little bit different because for us Ocean Protocol is a project and for us what we're looking for is really about, you know, again, going back to this, remember this first question I asked, who is used ADAPT? Yeah, where Where's the problem? And that's another thing that we can talk about, um, of course. And yeah, that's, that's the end of the presentation.
So I'll have some questions. Thank you. Uh, very inspiring and interesting. Uh, just on the very first part, you know, of the data ownership. If you don't take it into that kind of um, like like restricted access, or that you wouldn't, mm -hmm. if you just open a file, right, yep. and see the data. Uh, I mean, we have seen that, for example, with Google, right? We all thought if you have a journal publication or so, that could only be accessed through the journal. And then Google started to whatever scan them and then bring out digital copies. So once somebody has access this and, and, and whatever written an algorithm to digitize that, if it's just as simple as a screen capture, then suddenly uh, it's, it's, it, it can be transferred to other databases, right? Yep. So have you looked into that problem? If, if, if let's say you enable mm -hmm. one access, yep. how you prevent that it doesn't get out of your database and spread in, in an uncontrolled, unwanted way to others? Yeah, this is core to what we're doing, absolutely. And it's, it's I skipped over the slide, but um, yeah. So escape, escape of data, escape of model, and that's the issue down here is, you know, compared to, you know, what property is this thing I can take with me, and you have to fight me for it to get it back. But you know, digital data or digital assets, which is exactly what Ocean is dealing with, you can easily duplicate it. There's no expense. So um, this, again, this is just coming down to, well, basically, my opinion is that this no data escape is for, in the extreme case, the, the way to solve it. That's the answer, basically. So if you, if you because once it's, once it's on your local machine, that's, it's yours, essentially, and you can put that on BitTorrent if you want. Um, so that's why, that's exactly why no data escape is, is the most interesting. So that would be the process where, again, I go to this marketplace, I download a sample asset, which has been, let's say, anonymized or just small, and then I build my pipeline, and then I get access to training on the data on your premise, and I never am able to see the original data set. That's one solution. Maybe I ask a second question. I mean, data manipulation, let's say, for mm -hmm. certain purposes, right? Let's say I'm the president of Brazil, and you do this deforestation and uh, analysis, and I give you whatever photoshopped mm -hmm. data to provoke that a, a seemingly independent organization would come to a certain conclusion that would be favorable, let's say, for my policy or my economic prosperity or so on, uh, so how would you address data validation that somebody doesn't game or try to manipulate databases in a, in a, in a way that would be lead to certain outcomes that, that they would prefer? So it's a question of trust in the end. And there's many ways to, to enhance trust. So one way would be to have some type of verification, for example, of that data. So that would be another interesting mode of, um, so let's say that, I mean, even taking a step back, the first thing could be just curation, and that would be just reputation-based, so you upvotes, for example. And then you can get into things like staking and slashing as well. So I, I mean, it's all research, so there, I'm not gonna give you the answer, we don't know. Um, but these are all of, the, all of the things that were, you know, this, this protocol enables this type of, of thing. Um, the other interesting thing is, and it's getting away, like you're talking more about the manipulation of the raw data itself. So the question is, can you automate that? I don't think, I mean, if, you, if you're really good at Photoshopping, or maybe you just take satellite pictures of a different forest, right? It, how do you then, basically the question is, how do you oracleize that on chain? And in that case, unless, unless you control the source, there's not much you can do, really, in the end. Um, but with things like, what's, what could be interesting, for example, in, because one question we're quite interested in is the, the quality of a data set. The quality of a data set, actually, is something you can measure, because, and you can do it automatically, um, just by having a model train on that data. If that data has a signal in it, 
then theoretically you can train a model that should be able to perform better than random chance. So actually that's something you could automate and that's something that we're building as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you have uh, or anybody in your team already uh, spoke about this to actual scientists and data scientists and what was the what was their um, response to it? Uh, did you see any interest from them? Um, because we're also facing similar issues. So yeah. lots of beautiful ideas, lots of mm -hmm. uh, complex yep. uh, workflows, but mm -hmm. Are they going to use it? Are, are they going to know that they might really enjoy it? Mm -hmm. Of course, we've talked to lots of people, and a lot of people are interested. The question is, mm, are they actually willing to really use it? Yeah, because expressing interest, yeah, it's very cool, but actually using it, that's exactly where the point we're at now is, yeah. Again, like going back to the first question, have you used a DAP? <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, there's a lot of barriers. Um, I think a lot of it is UX issues. Um, just the fact that you still need to explain to people what's a private key, public key, what's the address. Yeah, these are all challenges. But um, we do see traction, absolutely do see traction. So we have, um, at Big Chain, we do have some clients lined up for some interesting collaborations to help solve actual business problems. And that's the most exciting part, definitely. You mentioned homomorphic encryption. Yeah. Is there are like other things coming up on the roadmap or something in trusted computing environments. Mm -hmm. Can you give a statement on where you are in terms of these technologies or to like yeah. prevent data leakage? Yeah, like, yeah. Because that's very mm -hmm. interesting for privacy mm -hmm. as well. In mm -hmm. that yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So on our GitHub page, we have a lot of work on this compute to data. So let's say Ocean Vertical. So a lot of um, really intense work on computed data. So we have two tracks on computed data. Because we have clients that are interested in it now, we have, a, a, let's say, a simpler version of computed data, which is a, um, an ability to basically call that endpoint. So that endpoint wasn't a difficult thing to, to pull together. And that means that that endpoint gives you, it receives a script, does some training, and sends back the model. I mean, basically Web 2.0. But what gets more interesting is, is the a, a fuller version. I'm just looking for the OEPs. Yeah, there we go. And, and that is that w what we're calling V2 is exactly this like full implementation. Where is it? I think it's in a branch. Yeah. It's, 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 um, it's really exciting because it's, it's working on the concept of Kubernetes operators, so that you specify an operator, and that's what's the engine driving the compute behind the scenes. So it's pulling, like, it's a very generalized concept to have any type of uh, transformer and then chain them together, so mutating things, and then finally publishing that result back to Ocean. So stay tuned. <laughs> Um, the computer data um, use case, does it assume that the parties are generally uh, um, trustworthy to each other, so they have like a, a, a faithful or, or a good um, relation with each other, or could it also be like real public users with mm -hmm. one being an attacker and using like maybe time-based side channel attacks and so on? Yeah. Do you have, so question, do you have to protect to these um, advanced attackers also with your... Yeah, good question. So, I mean, for, for the first steps, we have to assume a uh, trusting environment, let's say, trusting parties. But of course, the target is, is really to, to unlock things like genetics data. So there's, like, there's these amazing repositories of genetic data from different countries, which will, you'll never, you, know, you have to go into a cold room. You have to walk in, you have to place all your devices outside, enter, use the terminal there be, to, to even look at this data. So that's the target, um, and of course that's, that's a very, you have to make sure that you're working on this antagonistic framework. Um, and yeah, to guarantee that is, yeah, a research topic, <laughs> it's, but it's the goal, yeah. Cool. 
Okay, thank you. Hard, or do you think how much time would they need for it? Any guesses? Ten minutes, half an hour, okay. So it's pretty close. I found an average value of 13 minutes, uh, but obviously it depends um, on how complex the case is. And the second question is, what do you think how much would a pharma company pay to get access to your DNA data and maybe to ask you a few questions about your health or your lifestyle. Any guesses here? 50, nothing? 15, 100? Okay, so for most people, the range is between 100 and 200 US dollars, but there are also cases where it's much more. For example, Parkinson patients, uh, they get up to 20,000 US dollars, or their data is up to traded for up to 20K US dollars. So what I'm going to talk about today is the role of data and AI in healthcare, the current struggles that re researchers have using AI in healthcare, and then I will explore how a blockchain-based system could help, and then I'm gonna present three privacy-preserving technologies that are interesting in the context of AI and blockchain convergence and I'm gonna talk about current and future research projects in our group. So how does data serve AI to improve healthcare? Um, we have a lot of data in healthcare. We talked about genomics and medical imaging. There's also an emerging field of mobile health. With our smartphones, we can measure how many steps we do each day, but we can also measure our pulse using our smartphone camera. And as we just heard from Marcus, Data is essential for AI. There are several approaches toward building AI systems. The most common way nowadays is machine learning, but there are also other approaches such as knowledge bases. Maybe some of you have used Alpha, which at the core of its system uses a knowledge base approach. And this AI system can then generate positive impact in healthcare. It can, depending on the use case, for example, detect diseases, it can recommend therapies, or it could even be used to develop new therapies. So what's the struggle? It sounds good, but there are also struggles. Um, health data, obviously, is very sensitive data. We do not like, in general, to share our health data. We also don't want to get any ads on social media, for example, because we shared our DNA or something like that. So we really have, we are really careful and cautious when we, de de when we are dealing with sharing our health data. Sharing the health data also has implications on the data privacy of your relatives. If you think of genomics, for example, your DNA is very similar to the DNA of your parents or your siblings or your children. 
And if you share the data, it does not only maybe hurt your privacy, but also hurt the privacy of relatives. Obviously, there have been hacks and misuse of data. If we think of Equifax or Cambridge Analytica in other IT fields, so people are getting more and more aware of data privacy issues. They, there are also legal borders uh, for sharing data, so it's hard even in Germany to share data across hospitals in Germany, and it becomes even harder if you want to share data across hospitals internationally. There's also limited availability of data on rare diseases. And now the second category I'm talking about, it's a bit less obvious, is the power of avail available computing resources. Maybe some of you know machine learning can require large amounts of computing resources when we train models. So they are expensive, uh, energy intensive, and partially limited in their availability. And there are even tasks in machine learning or in um, computational biology in general, which are really, really hard to do computationally and where there's barely available computing power. One example is protein folding. There's this folding at home project from Stanford University, which is a very large distributed network of um, users doing protein folding calculations. Obviously nowadays the Bitcoin network is a larger distributed network but it's very interesting from a distributed systems point of view. So the question here is, can blockchain help to incentivize data sharing and computing resource uh, sharing? How would such a scenario look like? Well, the idea is that we have uh, hospitals that have patient data and they upload data either onto the blockchain or at least on a distributed file storage service and uh, manage access rights through the blockchain. And it's not just one hospital, but several hospitals. And then this data can be used. For example, it can be used um, by uh, other hospitals, which uh, maybe take, have a new patient, they measure some data, it might be genomic data or medical imaging based data. And then they get a recommended therapy with calculations done in a decentralized and privacy-preserving way. It could also be that university researchers like myself want to make use of that data, or maybe even pharma companies want to use that data, and maybe they then pay some token, which is then distributed to the people whose data is used, or to the hospitals. So what would be uh, the benefits of such a blockchain-based system? There's a large collaboration across hospitals, researchers, and industry, so there's much more data available, which improves AI systems. As a result, we get higher accuracy of those systems. Ideally, we do it in a privacy-preserving and self-controlled way, so the people down here who share their data have the ability, for example, to revoke their data sharing and to control over who has access over their data. We can use financial incentives for the data sharing and also outsource computation. So could we build such a system on tools that are available today? Obviously, uh, interesting here is Ethereum. It's a distributed computing platform, provides smart contracts ability, and it's the second largest cryptocurrency by market cap. And if we check whether it would be feasible today, well, Ethereum is immutable and has a global reach. We can also easily create or realize financial rewards over Ethereum. There's an emerging decentralized finance ecosystem around it. But there are two issues here. One is data privacy. So cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency systems are pseudonymous, but not really anonymous. And also scalability with regards to computing power, but also data storage capability. So we need scalable and privacy-preserving computation technologies to bring blockchain and machine learning together. What's out there? What computation technologies could we use? 
Traditionally, we have used cloud computing if we need large amounts of computing power, but that's not really what we want to go here for when we think of decentralization of uh, trust, of trusting nobody. Basically, in cloud computing, you have to trust the cloud computing provider. Um, maybe they are certified, but you still need to trust. What's interesting here is the field of privacy preserving computation technologies. There are three categories, one which I called edge computation and